Let's turn from the Lord's table to the Lord's word. As we focus our hearts on Easter or Resurrection Sunday, we're celebrating the good news of Jesus Christ all month long. What we want to have is a dedicated look at who Jesus is, why he came, and all the great difference that has made in human history and in our own lives. So we're extending Holy Week to be a holy month and to spend time each week looking at a different aspect of why he came and what that reveals about who he is. So Jesus came testifying and revealing. Jesus came healing. Jesus came delivering. He came serving. He came dying. So today we look at the first one of those is that Jesus came teaching. Many of us know the incorrect and derisive remark that those who can do and those who can't, well, they teach. But we know good teachers actually do quite a lot. Good teachers don't just know a lot of stuff. But they know something so well and they love that subject so much that they are very good at getting us to know it so well and to love it so much. They don't just have a subject figured out for themselves, but they have a skill in how to help us figure it out for ourselves, how to understand it and grasp it, how to be impacted by that truth. And to be impacted both with the knowledge of that subject, but also the love for learning and the love for that subject itself. Really good teachers know how to lead students to water. They know how to get students to think for themselves. They know how to encourage us when we struggle and we can't understand, we can't grasp the material. They are patient. Really good teachers are caring. They're often intelligent and creative. And the really good ones are passionate about what they're doing. Jesus is that kind of teacher and so much more. In the scriptures, Jesus is called rabbi. He's called teacher. Jesus came for more than teaching. Jesus is much more than a teacher, but we must Be careful, Jesus is certainly not less than a teacher. He is a teacher. Matthew 4, 23 reads, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Jesus Christ is the teacher of our lives. He teaches us about himself. He teaches us about his kingdom and his world He teaches us about us and who we are. And very profoundly, he teaches us how much we need him in our lives. He teaches us who the triune God really is. He teaches us about our sin and our hopelessness in trying to save ourselves. He teaches us the awesome beauty of his righteousness and His grace for the salvation of our lives. Jesus can fit in a line, sort of, with other spiritual leaders and great teachers in history, but as soon as you line Him up next to all these other fellows, He seems to explode the entire category about what it means to be a spiritual teacher. Jesus didn't need to find some supposedly golden tablets in a field in New York to explain things to us. He didn't need an angel to come down and tell him things and then have someone else write those things down for him. Jesus didn't need to sit under a Bodhi tree long enough to be enlightened and figure out the meaning of life. And Jesus Christ didn't even need to dialogue or sit under other masters and teachers and then glean from them the best of what they had and synthesize it into his own. No, Jesus is not just another sage or another guru. 
another part of the intelligentsia, another professor who's expounding novel ideas. Jesus doesn't need to quote other people, and he doesn't need to be provocative for its own sake to try to be unique. He is terribly unique. There's never been anyone else who teaches with the authority that Jesus teaches with, with such insight, with such wisdom, with such truth. There has never been a teacher like Jesus because he alone is God who teaches us. He doesn't just teach us about God, he teaches us as God. He doesn't just teach us about the world through observing the world, He teaches us about the world as the world's maker. He doesn't just teach us about the kingdom of God as one of its fellow subjects who's figured something out. He teaches about the kingdom as the king himself and the very constructor of the kingdom. He's like nobody else. He taught with such brilliance. He instructed in teachable moments and he taught in longer sermons. He taught with these parables that gripped the heart and made minds spin and chew on them. He taught with everyday objects and said, look at that. Look over there. But he did it in a way that opened up life to people and spoke to their truest needs. He taught just as he went through life on the highways and byways of life. He taught real lessons gritty things that kind of hit where the rubber meets the road in life. Practical things, things for today. And at the same time, he made minds wonder as he taught about things that happened in the very beginning of the creation of the world. And he taught things all the way to the end of the world when he is coming back. How did he teach? He taught with power. With power that he taught. He taught uniquely like nobody else before or since. Matthew 7, 28 records for us, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Mark 6 tells us about him coming to his own town, and his disciples followed him, and on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? Jesus taught with authority. Scribes at his time quoted other scribes and other rabbi to substantiate their teaching, to put footnotes on it and say, see, that's where I got that from. But Jesus is his own authority. He speaks as God because he is God, and that's why we read him say, but I say. He taught and quoted so much of the Old Testament But as he speaks it as God himself, the author of those scriptures, he he spoke and it was like a spring, like a clear water that rushed into people's souls like they had never heard it before. He spoke in a way with authority that dusted off people's souls and woke them up. He also taught with urgency. He wanted his listeners, he wanted his students to grab this today because it mattered so much for their lives right now. He taught with an urgency that said, you need to understand this today because it impacts your today and your tomorrow and your eternity. He taught with an urgency and he also taught with compassion. More than even the best teacher on earth ever could, Jesus loved his listeners. He loved the people he was teaching. And he didn't just easily write them off. Sometimes he said, you know, how long before you get this? How long before you trust in me? But he never just wrote people off and said, ah, you'll never get this. You can never understand this. He kept teaching even his enemies, the Pharisees, with compassion, teaching them again and again. Mark 6.34 says, When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. This is the kind of teacher Jesus is. 
And part of his compassion is he taught people the truth. He taught unwaveringly the truth. Sometimes he called people vipers that he was teaching. Sometimes he called them Satan. But he taught them in a way that was challenging to look inside their very heads and hearts, to look inside their souls, to look inside their life, to look inside their faith. He cared enough about people to teach them the truth and to teach them very hard things. Not just hard to understand, but hard to accept. Hard to see themselves in. His truth that he taught was so big about himself and about the kingdom. That not only we have four gospels, but in those gospels, he taught the same idea of the kingdom or salvation or God's love from many different angles so people could see it and feel it and hear it and understand its vastness to some degree. And Jesus also taught all over the place, and he taught all kinds of people. Matthew 4 tells us in verse 23, His fame spread throughout all Syria, and great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. He taught in homes of good people and bad people. He taught in synagogues. He taught in fields. He taught in a graveyard. He taught on a mountain. He taught noble men and he taught outcast women. He taught his family. He taught complete strangers. He taught teachers of the law and even the Roman leader of Jerusalem. And you think about that, Jesus was comfortable standing before Pilate teaching him as much as he was teaching little children. That Jesus, even as a boy, could school the elites, and yet he could also teach unschooled fishermen about who he is and what he desires. And Jesus taught with his whole life. He lived out what he was saying. He walked the walk. He taught and demonstrated who God is, what the kingdom looks like, what holiness and righteousness and meekness and peace look like. He taught it and he lived it right out. And very importantly, Jesus taught the good news. He taught the gospel. As he went teaching in synagogues, he was proclaiming the good news. He was teaching people to confess and to repent to not trust in their own works or their own kind of holiness, but to call upon him for mercy. In that way, he taught about himself that he is the Savior of the world and taught us to accept him and to come to him. So we need to hear what Jesus was teaching. We're going to look at just a tiny portion, a little sample of Jesus' teaching from Matthew 5, verses 1 through 16. There are so many great teachings of Jesus, it is very hard to choose one or two. You think of all the parables, all the great sermons, all the times with his disciples. But we're going to look at this, this very small slice at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And even in this tiny portion, each verse we hear could be its own sermon. It could be its own sermon series. I hope today that the Lord just impresses upon us the kind of teacher he is, what a little bit he's teaching, and that this really whets our appetite for the whole month of coming and looking upon him. And also that this, this will lead us to, to those devotions that we spoke of. Tomorrow is the calendar that they began, and they began right here with the Beatitudes. And they'll go much deeper than this, so I encourage you to do that. And today, we'll just get a taste of that. So as we do, let's pray as we come to God's Word. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would humble us, that you would teach us, give us teachable hearts and teachable minds, help us grasp who you are, help us accept your teaching about who we are, teach us again how much we need you, teach us how blessed we are to have you. We pray this in your blessed name, Jesus. Amen. So starting in Matthew 5, verse 1, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, 
And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. And so they, so, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So Jesus is here followed by this throng or massive crowd of onlookers who were likely shocked and somewhat enthralled by his unique and amazing teaching. But Jesus, the teacher here, teaches by removing himself to a height above them on some ridge, most likely with a magnificent view of the Sea of Galilee where he was. And then he sits down to teach from his own mouth. And he comes to teach his disciples more than the twelve, but this kind of inner group, as the crowd has been looking as onlookers, this inner disciple group is someone who has more of a commitment and wants to hear from this teacher. And he sits down and teaches them. And what a message they heard that day. This goes on for chapters in what is collectively called the Sermon on the Mount. And what Jesus is saying here in the entire sermon, it it drives us to our knees in repentance and a confession that says, I'm not like that. Almost in a way to look at this and say, Jesus, do you really mean these things? Is this realistic? Is this just for a future generation, another utopia, or is this for today? And what Jesus is telling us is greatly challenging, and it is greatly revealing, especially of who he is and what he desires. But I believe it's not only for the life to come, but Jesus is saying this and calling his disciples to be this, and then enabling them to do this in this present age. That he gives a picture of the life of one of his followers, a life that's lived out in the presence and the power, the indwelling of God. Kingdom life, lived out in everyday life as real people. I think we need to recognize that this sermon, the whole thing as you go on to read it this week, is directed at disciples and through them to his church full of disciples. As you read this, if your heart is like mine, you will feel a subtle tug that wants to work around this and say, Jesus couldn't possibly really mean all of that. I mean, maybe, but it's kind of exaggerated, right? You might feel a tug to say, well, I'm kind of like that. I mean, don't I just do my best and he kind of just grades me on that? I mean, no one can do this. But Jesus is telling here what holy people look like. As the sermon goes on, he gives after these beatitudes 
what he calls people to be like, and he gives the antithesis of what they are not to be like, full of anger and lust and vengeance. But he starts with these beatitudes to lay out for us his kingdom and what he wants. This, this word beatitude is coming from the fact that this word blessed is repeated again and again in here. This word means in one sense happy or lucky or how wonderful. And as we read it, it should be shocking to us. How wonderful are the persecuted ones? How wonderful are the meek? When this word blessed is used in Scripture, it means a holistic spiritual health, a holistic spiritual well-being. Someone is blessed and they are spiritually well because they have been accepted by God. And because they're accepted by God, they have a joyous destiny, a joyous life right now and forevermore. This week, you can look at Psalm 1 and what it says, Blessed is the man who delights in God's law. The law that was given to covenant people, people who delight in the Lord and their relationship with Him. He says, these are blessed people. These are people who are accepted by God. What he's saying is, these are the people who are accepted by God, approved by God, and then these are the rewards of that life with God of this blessed condition. What Jesus is describing here is the nature of these people. This is the way kingdom people are. And he describes the aspirations of these people. This is what kingdom people desire and what they want. He's saying that this is what disciples of Jesus have now in a life with him and what disciples are becoming in him. Christ is also, through these Beatitudes and through the whole sermon, not just revealing the kind of people he wants, but he's revealing the kind of God he is and what he wants, what he desires, what he is like. His holiness, his love, his kindness, his meekness is the standard of all of this. As Jesus went up to this mountaintop, Many people might have been thinking that he was going to kick off a revolution of sorts. Oftentimes, this is what people did in those places. And as many of us know, the people had different expectations of a Messiah who was coming. Many were looking for his rule and his reign to mean the expulsion of Rome and a return to the monarchy of Israel. But what Jesus explains in the Beatitudes and the rest of the sermon is what a life looks like that is under his rule right now, when he is the king of your heart, when he rules in your life. He tells us how we will live when Jesus is our Lord. Make no mistake, this is not a list of do's and don'ts. Again, this isn't where we say, well, we try our best and then God just grades us on a curve. When we say these are the blueprints of kingdom living, I don't want to be confused. These are not how you build your life to be accepted by God. And this certainly is not how we build God's kingdom. When we say these are the blueprints, they're not just instructions for our life or how we build a life. They're not how you earn your way into the kingdom but they are what is made from and how the building is constructed itself. They are blueprints of the kingdom about what the kingdom looks like and what the king of the kingdom has constructed, starting with our lives. This is not a guide for how you live your life by yourself. Jesus wasn't teaching us just good ideas to inspire us or that if we follow these, then we will have a blessed life. That these are somehow the secrets to getting what we want out of God. These are not ways to get blessed. These are not ways to get what we want. These are expressions of people who are already blessed by God. Meaning accepted by Him. They're all about God. 
and His glory and His holiness, that His people and His kingdom are set apart to be made like Him and to serve Him in glory. Again, to put a fine point on it, this isn't how you get into the kingdom of God. This is what it looks like when you're inside the kingdom of God. This isn't a key in. This is a map of what it looks like. Kingdom people are called by Jesus' grace out of their sin. And He calls them and puts a new heart in them that they delight in Him alone progressively. And as His people, they reorient progressively their life around Him and His desires and His glory. The Beatitudes are what saved people are looking like in Jesus Christ. If you think about the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments are like a mirror so that they shut the mouth of everyone who looks upon them and says, I am not innocent before God. Before I read that, I thought I was okay. But the Ten Commandments reveal to me as a mirror, I'm a sinner before God. The Beatitudes reveal to me who Christ is making me to be and who I am in Christ now and the heart that he gives me. When we look upon this, we think about that what Jesus is setting forth in his Beatitudes are shocking. They're shocking about who he calls blessed, who he calls the lucky ones, the happy ones, the joyful ones, the ones who are accepted by him. But in Scripture, like Isaiah 40, we were told that when Jesus would come, He would set things right. He would put the exalted down and then exalt the lowly. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways. That's what Jesus is doing. He's not turning the world upside down. He's turning it right side up. You think of every revolution that has ever come in human history, they are trying to destroy the world or reform the world from the outside by killing kings or changing laws or making declarations and making a new society, ending an economy. They're all trying to do it externally, but here comes the Lord Jesus saying, no, 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 this is an internal work that he will do in our hearts. Karl Marx has his communist manifesto. Our forefathers had their declaration of independence. Jesus Christ here gives the declaration of his kingdom. The king is now standing on earth. The kingdom has come, and he says, this is what it looks like. These are the people who inhabit it. If you look around our culture today, people are still doing the same thing. Even right now in our cultural moment, people are trying to right the world, aren't they? Whether they're on the conservative right or the progressive left, everyone's trying to redefine terms, what marriage is, what love is, what equality is, what justice is, what life should look like. And to do that, we have to topple those people, change this law, make a new society. Be the change we want to see in the world. And I ask you, how much of it has ever worked? The Lord God doesn't come with new ideas and novel concepts. He's not trying to inspire us to change laws or fix external things. But he looks at a lot of people who walk around thinking they know what they're doing in life, and he says, i got to tell you the truth, folks. You're like a whitewashed tomb. You're like a cup. You clean on the outside, but the inside is rotten. You can put up this front about your reform and your revolution and your change, but no one's getting to the heart. Jesus came teaching what that means in this heart, describing that here. As we think about these beatitudes, the people Jesus is calling blessed are blessed because he is declaring them to be so. But think of for a moment to get to the heart of this. Who would our culture, who would you call blessed today? I'm guessing it wouldn't be the meek or the persecuted 
or the pure in heart. I wrote down some myself this week. Blessed are the achievers. They will work hard and they will make their dreams come true. Blessed are the rich, for they will buy what they want and have security. Blessed are the winners, because they're never going to be defeated. Blessed are the powerful, for they will never be pushed around and people will do what they say. Blessed are the brilliant, because they have life all figured out. Blessed are the beautiful, because people will really love them and admire them. Blessed are the cool, because they'll never be left out. They'll always be accepted. Blessed are the free, for they will always do whatever they want. You think about who's blessed in our culture, and our society. It's the pushy. It's sometimes, it's the politicians, it's the celebrities, it's the rich, it's the influencers. But the Lord Jesus says, blessed in his definition, goes across every race and every class and every occupation. No matter what you have or you don't have, in his kingdom you can be blessed and he will make it so. Well, the key to this, and maybe the only one we can get to today, is the first one there in verse 3. But this is really the key, I believe, to the rest of the Beatitudes and really the rest of the Sermon on the Mount and the rest of the gospel. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. As he goes to describe what kingdom life looks like and who's in the kingdom, he says here, these are people who are, those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are they. He starts right away with the heart issue of spiritual poverty. It's a good place to begin as we look into kingdom life and gospel life. Because what Jesus says here, it needs to govern the heart of every Christian. And it shapes the way we look at ourselves and the way we look at the world and definitely the way we look at our Lord. The poor in spirit are not necessarily materially poor, though sometimes they go well together. They are not people who are poor that they have a low self-esteem or They're a doormat or they have a low view of themselves or low view of their life. Rather, the poor in spirit are those who are fully aware of their profound need for God in every dimension of their life. They are people who have understanding their profound need for the Lord in every dimension of their life. They have come to peace, really, with the reality that God is God and they are not. This is the beginning of wisdom. This is the beginning of the Christian life. There is a God, and it's not you. God is righteous, and you are not. God is in control, and you ultimately are not. This is not just a man or woman confessing that by nature we are insignificant or of little value. But it's a confession by a man or a woman that I am sinful and I am rebellious and I'm utterly without any moral virtues with which I can commend myself to God. The secret is how do we get this? Poverty of spirit, it can't be artificially induced. It can't come from the outside by people telling us this or giving us a low view of ourself, or just reminding us of our unrighteousness. It comes from the Holy Spirit who graciously works in our lives, shining the light of Christ upon us to see who we are and who He is and how much we need Him, that He's working in our hearts to bring this about. And we respond. People who get this by God's grace, are people who have come to understand their own moral bankruptcy. Morally, I am bankrupt. Spiritually, I'm in debt. And I can't get myself out of this hole. And I can't start over. And thus, I intimately know I have a personal need for redemption. I have a debt, and I have to pay it off, and I don't know how. 
But people who are spiritually poor have come to no longer depend on themselves to get out of that debt. No longer to trust their abilities, their moral framework, their ethics, their doing to get out of that hole. You see, every time we turn to idolatry or one of the religions of the world, what they tell you is you can actually do this given enough time and enough virtue and enough practice. You can pay off your debt. But spiritually poor says, I have nothing with which to even start getting out of this debt. I have nothing when I stand naked before the righteous God with which I can barter with him or trade or placate him or give him even a down payment. I have nothing. Many of us, thanks be to God, don't know real poverty. Some of us have in our life. But I believe, spiritually speaking, Jesus isn't just talking about the working poor, those, those of us who live check to check, but somehow we make it. Jesus is talking about the totally poor. The kind of person, I believe, who, spiritually speaking, is begging for every scrap they get. The next meal, the next drink of water. I am spiritually dependent upon someone to give me that. To be spiritually poor, I come to understand whatever I have in this life spiritually, I got by begging, not by earning. I got by mercy, not by my own morals. Poor in spirit means that by God's grace, I've come to understand when I read in Scripture, I am the spiritually sick that needs a doctor. That's me. When I come to read the Scripture, I say I'm the spiritual beggar, morally bankrupt, crying out to Jesus as he passes me, Savior, please, I'm the lost sinner, save me. We come to realize as we read Scripture when we're spiritually poor, I'm not the hero, but I'm the villain. I'm not David killing the giant, I'm David looking at Bathsheba. When I read scripture, I can see myself and see Naaman's arrogance and say, that looks like me. Jacob's pride sounds like me. Peter's abandonment looks like me treating Jesus. Cain's murderous heart, I know that. His father's rebellious spirit and his mom's, I've lived that. When I read scripture, spiritually poor now, I see that I'm the moral leper. I'm the prostitute. I'm the person blown away that Jesus would eat at my table and come to my house. I'm the tax collector that's beating his chest. Show me mercy for I'm a sinner. This is what it means to be spiritually poor. I'm the disciple that's responding. I'm not worthy to untie his sandals much less get his love. That's who I am when I'm spiritually poor. And the people who are spiritually poor, they call upon Jesus for his grace. That's why their reward is the kingdom of heaven. They cry out to him, I have nothing. Would you pay my debt? And Jesus says, the kingdom is open to you, those who accept that he did pay their debt. If asked at the gates of heaven, why do you belong here? A spiritually poor person has nothing to answer, but certainly not for anything I am. Certainly not for anything I did. And if asked again, well then why should we let you into the kingdom? They can only answer, because now I'm clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. For he alone has paid my debts forgiving my sins and giving me his spirit. I am terribly poor in myself, but my Savior Jesus Christ has made me rich in his righteousness. I don't know why all of it, but he lavished his grace upon me in abundance. And so I am here. That's the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit then leads to repentance. When the Holy Spirit illuminates our spiritual poverty, it leads us to repent of any ways and any means that we've tried to save ourselves. 
that we've tried to be our own God, to rely on ourselves. And in that repentance, we become like Jacob last week, just clinging to God, holding on for his mercy and asking for his blessing. Would you bless me? I can't fight anymore. I can't earn anything. I realize all I can do is hold on. Jesus, have mercy on me. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says this better than I ever will be able to. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Think upon the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he, for your sake, became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich in his salvation. The Lord Jesus Christ poured himself out so that we who are spiritually poor could be filled up with his righteousness and his life. As long as you and I hold on to any illusions, any delusions of grandeur that I'm not that bad of a person, we miss out on fully understanding the grace and the blessedness of being in his kingdom. What he does progressively in our heart, I believe, is continue to break those walls down of all the ways that I feel like, well, God, I know I'm not rich, but spiritually speaking, I do have a little savings I've scraped together over the years. I'm not rich like those people, but I'm not poor like those people. I'm okay, right? By God's grace, he wipes all that out, doesn't he? And gets us to know, no, I am bankrupt without God. But he has come to my rescue and redeemed me. The theologian Carson says this very beautifully. The kingdom of heaven is not given on the basis of race, earned merits. It's not given on the military zeal and the prowess of zealots or the wealth of a Zacchaeus. It's given to the poor the despised publicans, the prostitutes, those who are so poor, they know they can offer nothing and so they do not try. They cry for mercy and they alone are heard. You know, one day millionaires will sink into insignificance and all the things we treasure, they're going to evaporate or someone else is going to take them. But for those who are poor in spirit, they are given a kingdom that is never shaken, a faultless, perfect kingdom of God. They are allowed in to this kingdom life, this boundless, forever and ever life with Jesus Christ, and it will never, ever be taken from you. And so you are blessed because you are accepted by God. You have cried out, and He has heard you. The one who is merciful has saved you. I believe this is why this poor in spirit is first, why this is the key. Puts the following commands all in perspective. They cannot be fulfilled by one's own strength. All the other things we're reading, we understand, I need to rely on God for that. It has to start with spiritual poverty. No one mourns until they are poor in spirit. No one is meek towards other people until he has been humbled by his own spiritual poverty. If you don't sense your own need and your own poverty, you will never hunger and thirst after righteousness because you snack on little things. If you have too high of a view of yourself, you will find it very difficult to be merciful to others. If you don't know how Jesus Christ had made peace in your life when you were at war with him, you will never be a peacemaker. This is where it starts. Very briefly, we don't have time, but just to look at the second one, this is where mourning comes from. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. What are they mourning? In the context of this, they're not mourning over dead loved ones. They're mourning over their sin and its effects on their life. They're mourning over the failure of mankind to give proper glory to God. The proper reaction of spiritual poverty is spiritual mourning. Spiritually poor people look around the world and they see it's in shambles and they mourn that it's not the way it should be. 
when they look at themselves and say, I've been part of that whole problem as a sinner. And I am mourning not just for the consequences of sin, but for the reality of sin in my life before God. This is the kind of of life that God gives us. This mourning is a, is a godly sorrow that produces repentance in us. This godly sorrow is not the destination, but it's the path to the destination for repentance. In the ancient Greek, this is the strongest word that's possible for mourning. Jesus isn't speaking of a casual sorrow about my sin, but a deep, deep grieving that I grieve over my sin like I do over the person in my life who I love the most and they died. That's the way I feel about my sin. And my spiritual poverty turns into mourning. I used to look at the world and say, God, why is there so much evil in this world? And now in spiritual poverty, by God's grace, I turn into mourning. Oh, my Lord, how was there so much evil in my life and you let me go on living? How was there so much evil in my world and yet you forgave me. And that's why they will be comforted. There's a day, as we have sung, that there will be a day that there will be no more tears. And there will be no more crying. But why won't there be? Because there will be no more sin. Sin is the root of all of our heartache and all of our mourning. And there's a day coming when we will be forever comforted. But those who are spiritually poor and spiritually mourning God, Jesus can promise in the here and now they are also comforted. Because of my spiritual mourning, I'm grieved by my sin because I have nowhere to put it and I can't cover it. But Jesus, in his sacrifice and acceptance of me, he wipes away my sin and my shame and my guilt and comforts me with his righteousness and holiness and acceptance and love. There is no greater comfort than the Savior Jesus Christ. Those who are spiritually poor and those who mourn, He can guarantee you will be comforted because He will accept you. And then you are blessed. Our world, though, is seeking all kinds of comfort to cover up what's really going on with our sin. And that's why we are called to be salt and light into the world. Salt is a preserving agent. We live in a rotting, decaying world because of its sin. But we are sent out as salt. We don't become salt. He says, you are salt. Right now, if you believe in him, you are a preserving agent in the world that it can remain as you share the gospel and tell people the gospel. You are a light in the world to reveal I know the Comforter, and His name is Jesus Christ. He taught me who I am. He taught me who He is. And He taught me that He forgave me. And He can do the same for you. Jesus knew physical pain. Jesus knew abandonment. But in the Scriptures, Jesus' greatest mourning is that though His arms are open wide, many of the sheep will not come home to Him because they believe they're okay on their own. And he mourns that they will not come, especially the Jewish people, back to him and know his comfort. To sum up, you're happy when you're desperate and you're out of options and you cling to the Lord. You're happy when you've lost things that seem so precious and you are now aware of your sin and you see his grace. That's what happy, that's what blessed is. You're happy when you don't think too much of yourself anymore, but you think everything of Jesus. You're happy when all the materials, all the pleasures, all the accolades, all the destinations you can travel to, when you get them, they leave you starving and unfulfilled, but you find satisfaction in Him. You're happy when you don't hit back at those who hurt you, but you know how gracious Jesus was to you as a sinner. You're happy when you're made pure in heart and you're continuously purified by the Holy Spirit. You're happy when you're gospelizing and unifying, bring Jesus' shalom to the world when you're a peacemaker. 
You're happy when people mock you and spit on you and revile you because they see Jesus in you and because now you know what his suffering is like and in that there is blessedness. You are very blessed when Jesus is your teacher. You are very blessed when Jesus is your Lord. Blessed are the ones who praise and sing, blessed be your name, Jesus Christ. Blessed be you forever and ever, the Redeemer, the blessed Son, the blessed Savior, the blessed King of kings and the blessed Lord of lords. That's his blessed life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, these words are astounding of yours. We can only thank you, Lord God, that we who have nothing have become so enriched by your grace and your righteousness poured out to us. But to remark, what kind of love is this that you would give it to destitute, poor, moral, bankrupt people like us? But it's true. You have made us sons and daughters of the Most High God. That in you, Lord Jesus, we are blessed because you've accepted us. Lord, let us be that salt and light this week that you have called us to go out into a dark world and a decaying world and share the blessed Savior, Jesus Christ, with it. We pray this in your holy name, Lord. Amen.